the biggest post-election announcement is the formation of the new United Socialist Party of Venezuela. Ya llegó la hora. Llegó la hora. But there's less than enthusiastic applause from the high-priced seats. Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez is one of the most controversial politicians in the world. His supporters argue that he has done more for the poor of his country than any previous Venezuelan leader. They also say that he has begun a revolutionary process that will redefine a new socialism for the 21st century. His opponents say that this former military officer is an authoritarian figure whose economic policies are unworkable. So where does the truth lie? Timeline looks at the history of Venezuela and the rise of Hugo Chavez. In 1999, Hugo Chavez initiated a referendum that adopted a new constitution for Venezuela. At the same time, the country was given a new name. Since then, Venezuela has been known as the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. The new name was chosen to honor Simon Bolivar, the early 19th century hero who fought to liberate much of South America from the Spanish Empire. Bolivar came to London to ask the British for support. He didn't get it, but he succeeded in any case. In a series of dramatic political and military campaigns between 1810 and 1824, Simon Bolivar freed an area that includes modern Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Bolivia and Venezuela from European rule. Indeed, until 1830, Venezuela was part of Gran Colombia, the first post-colonial state that Bolivar established. It also covered modern Ecuador and Colombia. Since that moment, Bolivar has remained a potent symbol of national independence, as this 1940s comic book shows. And in modern day Venezuela, Bolivar's name continues to have enormous resonance, and this image still adorns the walls of the Venezuelan capital Caracas, his birthplace. Hugo Chavez has deliberately recalled the legend of Bolivar to underline his own radical and anti-imperial policies. Sí, estamos armados, pero estamos armados de ideas y de esto, de la constitución, de los pensamientos de Bolívar, de la ideología bolivariana, de eso que estamos armados nosotros. For most of Venezuela's history, it has been ruled by military dictators. Democratic government only replaced military rule in 1959. Even then, a pact between the two major pro-business mainstream parties meant that most ordinary Venezuelans had little impact on how the elites governed the country. Venezuela's economy is dominated by oil. Oil revenue accounts for half the government's budget. Venezuela is a member of OPEC, and oil, its most valuable commodity, shapes the country's economic welfare. But even with its oil earnings, Venezuela has remained a deeply divided society. In Caracas, desperately poor shantytown dwellers live in a world that's miles from that of the rich. In the 1960s, it was said that there were more Cadillac owners in Caracas than in Chicago. The oligarchy treated the nationalized oil industry as their own personal fiefdom. Hugo Chavez knew all about the inequalities of Venezuelan life from an early age. He was born in a mud hut, the second son of an impoverished family of two school teachers. At the age of 17, he joined the army. Hugo Chavez's first political organization was a cell of army officers although it also sold alliances with left-wing groups outside the army. Founded in 1982, it was committed to overthrowing a political establishment that Chavez regarded as corrupt and unrepresentative. It was called the Bolivarian Revolutionary Movement, and it was known by its initials MBR 200. The figure 200 was a reference to the 200th anniversary of Simon Bolivar's birth. But it was not Chavez or his fellow army officers that first revolted against the corrupt oligarchy that dominated Venezuelan life. It was the poor of the shanty towns themselves. As the Venezuelan elite adopted neoliberal, free market economic policies, poverty soared. It rose from 36% of the population in 1984 to 66% in 1995. Unemployment doubled. 
making Venezuela the country with the most unemployed in Latin America. The rich got richer and the poor got poorer. In February 1989, petrol prices rose and so did the fares on public transport. Students organized a bus boycott. Protests then spread throughout the country. They were strongest of all in Caracas. The poor stormed onto the streets. President Perez sent in the army, and the army shot to kill. No one knows how many died, but the toll is unlikely to have been less than 2,000. The dead were mainly from the slums. The so-called Caracaso uprising was suppressed. But ever since, demonstrations, protests and street actions have become part of Venezuelan life. The workers and the poor could be suppressed, but they were not willing to allow Venezuela's rulers to go back to their old ways. And there was another consequence of the defeat of the Caracaso. Hugo Chavez and his MBR 200 movement attempted to remove the Perez oligarchy in a coup just three years later. Colonel Chavez and the troops loyal to him attempted to seize the presidential palace and other key buildings. But the coup failed and Perez gave Chavez a single minute of TV time to announce his surrender. Compañeros, lamentablemente, por ahora, los objetivos que nos planteamos no fueron logrados en la ciudad capital. Chavez told viewers that the coup had failed for the moment. The coup earned Chavez national recognition and two years in prison. A year later, President Perez, the man who jailed him, was suspended from office after the High Court ruled that he embezzled and misused public funds. Chavez emerged from jail in 1994 after a presidential pardon and he reformed the MBR 200. He also created a new political party, the Fifth Republic Movement. In December 1998, Venezuela's rulers were stunned when Hugo Chavez won the presidency with 57% of the vote. It wasn't the last shock the old elites had to endure. Chavez took office in February 1999 and ordered a referendum asking Venezuelans if they wanted to elect an assembly to draw up a new constitution. 88% voted in favour. Chavez supporters dominated the Constitutional Assembly and in December 1999, 71% voted in favour of the new constitution. The following year, Chavez was elected for a six-year term on 59% of the vote under the new constitution. The new constitution of the Bolivarian Republic was distributed throughout the country and even printed on packets of food. Within the year, Feda Camaras, Venezuela's leading business association, was working with the conservative forces of the CTV Labour Confederation to call a one-day general strike against Chavez's economic and land reform policies. But this was just the prelude. The real struggle in Venezuela was still to come. In February 2002, Chavez sacked General Lameda as head of the state oil giant PDVSA. A former communist militant replaced him. Privileged oil workers slowed down vital oil production. In April, Feder Camaras declared an indefinite general strike. The privately owned media mounted a huge campaign against Chavez. The opposition called a 150,000 strong march, which headed for the presidential palace, clashing with Chavez supporters. Snipers and police opened fire on the Chavez supporters and they returned fire. Ten are left dead and 110 were injured in this exchange. 
When the privately owned TV station showed the footage of the shooting, they reversed the order of the film so that it appears that the Chavez supporters opened fire first on a peaceful demonstration, cutting out film from camera angles which revealed the truth. High-ranking military officers demanded that Chavez resign. On April 11, 2002, the military launched a coup, arrested Chavez and appointed Pedro Carmona, one of the strike organisers and the leader of Feta Camaras, as head of a transitional government. The poor surged onto the streets of Caracas. Massive protests by ordinary Venezuelans surrounded the presidential palace and demanded the return of Chavez. The demonstrations were so large and the crowd's anger so great that Carmona was forced to resign and Chavez was flown back to the presidential palace in a helicopter. Relief swept through the crowds and registered on the faces of Chavez's besieged ministers and supporters within the palace. Mass mobilization saved the Chavez government. The coup had been defeated. It was a turning point. But the old rulers had not finished trying to destroy the Chavez government. In December 2002, business leaders initiated another strike in the crucial oil industry. It did massive damage to the economy, but it also backfired. Most Venezuelans blamed the right rather than Chavez. The strike ended in February 2003. Three months later, the opposition were ready to act again. But previous defeats now forced them to work within the constitution. In May 2003, they began collecting signatures to trigger a new referendum on Chavez's rule. They finally got their way in 2004. But, much to the dismay of the business elite, Chavez won the referendum. In 2006, he won another six-year term as president. So why is it that Hugo Chavez's government is so bitterly opposed by the Venezuelan elite? Is it because of his radical economic policy? Well, it's certainly true that the business leaders don't like nationalisation because it gives to the state revenues that previously came to them as private profit. But in fact, the level of nationalisation in Chavez's Venezuela is not that extraordinary. Some point to the fact that the most important industry, oil, is nationalised but so is the oil industry in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and Iran. And in any case, oil was nationalised long before Chavez came to power, although he did move against the managers who were exploiting it for their own gain. In 2006, Chavez nationalised the telecommunications giant CAN-TV and some electricity generation companies as well. But telecommunications had previously been nationalised and then privatised, so Chavez was just bringing it back in to public ownership and electricity generation was already 80% publicly owned. There has recently been some more nationalisation in response to the recession, but these and the earlier nationalisations have all generously compensated the previous private owners. And the Venezuelan state's overall spending is just 30% of national wealth, which is a figure below the 49% spent in France and the 52% spent in Sweden. So if Chavez's nationalisation programme alone is not the cause of disquiet for the political right, what is? Chavez's social policy provides part of the answer. Venezuela's massive oil reserves have been used in ways that no previous government would even have considered. Central government social spending has rocketed from 8.2% of national wealth when Chavez was elected to 13.6% in 2006. That's an increase of a 170% for every Venezuelan. And that's an underestimate. 
if the social spending of the nationalised oil giant Pedevesa is included, the increase is 314% per head of the population. Access to education at all levels has risen by an average of more than 30%. There are now 12 times more healthcare professionals in Venezuela than when Chavez came to power. Food is subsidised through special Mercal stores and poverty has been halved. These changes and the political defeats inflicted on the establishment forces that try to unseat Chavez have made the workers and poor of Venezuela more confident. They see and sense that a better world is possible. And it is this, more than the changes in economic ownership, which have so profoundly unsettled Venezuela's traditional rulers. They fear that this confidence among ordinary Venezuelans will endanger their wealth and remaining power. When Chavez talks of socialism, when he opposes US foreign policy, the right fear that he will unleash an even more radical process than the Bolivarian Revolution. So can Chavez survive? Chavez's opponents have been defeated on every occasion when they've challenged him, but they are not finished. In 2007, Chavez lost a vote to extend his presidential powers. In recent local elections, Chavez was again victorious, but the opposition made gains, especially in important oil producing areas and near the Colombia border, from where many believe they get US inspired aid. Chavez represents too big a threat for the establishment to let him go unchallenged for long. Estamos medio comiendo, no estamos ni comiendo ni lo que comíamos antes, porque vamos al automercado y a veces tenemos que contar los víveres porque no nos alcanza el dinero y a los venezolanos eso nos ha, nos ha afligido muchísimo, porque no estamos acostumbrados a vivir así como él quiere que vivamos como los cubanos. Y por Robin Hood, que le iba a quitar a los ricos para, para llevarse a los pobres, mira, o sea, la gente se agarró de eso y empezó a... Bueno, me opongo a Hugo Chávez porque su simpatía hacia el régimen comunista. But on each occasion when Chavez has been threatened in the past, it has been the mass mobilization of the Venezuelan workers and poor that have saved him. Faced with a recession, they will expect the government to aid them, to adopt more radical policies that prevent them from paying for the crisis, that defend the social welfare policies that have reduced poverty, improved literacy and healthcare. Some workers, like those at the Inverpal paper mill and the Santarios Maracay ceramics factory, have already taken matters into their own hands, taking control of the factories and demonstrating with the aim of winning support from the government for their action. Chavez's survival will depend on how he reacts to these developments, whether he embraces them as a deepening of the process of progressive change in Venezuela or whether he tries to limit this process. There are dangers either way, if Chavez embraces more radical change, he will no doubt face intensified opposition from the right. But they will oppose him, whatever he does next. If he does not embrace more radical change, he risks disappointing and demobilising the very people who have saved him from the establishment on every previous occasion when he's been attacked. This is now the choice that faces Hugo Chavez and the Venezuelan people. This has been Timeline, Hugo Chavez's revolution.